So hello everyone and welcome to eCampus's second digital transformation community of practice webinar on understanding digital transformations findings by the 2023 CDLRA spring survey. Uh, my name is Monica uh, Shah and I am a digital transformation associate on the research and foresight team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on running uh, the leadership for digital transformation micro credential. Uh, we also have my manager, Laura Vaselli, joining us today, along with other e uh, team members from eCampus Ontario. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our main presenter for today, which I will just be doing in a bit. Uh, so a little bit about our speaker. So we have Dr. Nicole Johnson. She is the executive director of the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, where she leads annual longitudinal research studies exploring pan-Canadian trends related to digital learning at post-secondary institutions. She also has an independent research and consulting practice and works on research teams at the Royal Broads University, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, at Bayview Analytics, uh, which is in Oakland, California. Her primary research interests include tracking macro level trends in digital learning at the post-secondary level, defining and operationalizing key terms associated with digital learning, investigating faculty experiences with technology, exploring the future of higher education, and better understanding how adults learn informally in digital contexts. Uh, before I pass on the bait into our speaker, a little bit about eCampus uh, for those who are new to eCampus Ontario. eCampus is a provincially funded nonprofit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutes to advance the use of educational technology and digital learning environments. Uh, our membership includes 53 institutions in this province. Our members are faculty, uh, we have administrators, student support services, registrar's office, teaching assistants and learners. Uh, we actually welcome anyone involved in post-secondary education in Ontario to come uh, find the right opportunity for them. Uh, okay, so just to get the stage rolling and just to, because we are here to talk about uh, the survey results in the DX context, I just want, I thought that the best way would be that let's just, uh, you know, have a poll question. Um, so here is the first poll question. Uh, how how's your DX journey been? You know, DX is such a broad word and we are all talking about digital transformation. So how's your DX journey been? Uh, there are a few options. I'm just going to launch the poll. If you could just take some time and, uh, you know, uh, complete the poll. So how's your DX journey? We're not moving. Interesting. Hmm. We're right in the thick. We made a start. Wow. Nice. I wow, this is great. Uh, I think Nicole, you would also once you, you know, this is interesting to see that most of the people here are saying that we've already made a start. Uh, you know, forty one percent and thirty eight percent are saying we are right in the thick of it. So this is really interesting. Let me just end this poll and just give me a sec. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how are we at eCampus supporting digital transformation? Higher education is in the era of digital transformation where institutions are redefining how we teach and learn. Digital transformation or DX is far more than simply adopting a new technology uh, or supporting online education. Instead, we are looking at the infusion of digital tools into complex educational systems that transform an institution's operations, strategic directions, and value proposition. And I think I want to stress at this point that when we talk about technology, we are also paying equal importance to the learning pedagogy that's involved in it. So at eCampus is, com uh, is committed to fostering digital transformation in the province's higher education sector by providing digital by design uh, program services that are responsive to the shifts and opportunities in the educational and employment landscape. 
Uh, that said, we understand that DX is not a straightforward, uh, straightforward journey. And that's why the objective behind uh, you know, creating this DX community of practice is to have a platform where we can have meaningful conversations around digital transformation in higher education. For the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear from Dr. Nicole Johnson, who will share how findings from the 2023 CDLRA Spring Survey can help us better understand digital transformation. And this will be followed by the Q&A session. So if you have any questions during it, please uh, please post them in the chat. We will be monitoring. And towards the end of the session, we will try and attempt to answer most of your questions. So I will stop sharing and hand over the controls to our speaker, Dr. Nicole Johnson. There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, delighted to be here. I'm going to share my screen, but um, seeing lots of people who are in the chat who I know and um, lots of amazing people. So I'm very excited to share our findings, but also for the Q&A discussion that we've got coming up as well. So today, as mentioned, I'm going to be sharing some of the findings from our uh, spring survey this year and it ran from May through the end of June. But before I get into that too, I just wanna uh, acknowledge the lands that I'm on as well. So I'm over coming to you from BC today and I live and work um, on the traditional unceded shared territory of the Matsqui and the Sumas First Nations. And those two First Nations have resided in the um, Fraser Valley area of, the Brit of British Columbia for more than 10,000 years. And um, in my work and in my day-to-day -day life, uh, it's really important to me that I'm paying attention and recognizing the impact of, colon of colonialism in my community. And then also with my work with CDLRA um, more broadly and uh, with it across the country. So about the CDLRA, if you're not familiar with us and what we do, uh, we are a nonprofit organization and we've been running annual Pan-Canadian surveys since 2017. And our surveys have evolved over the years. When we started in 2017, it was a once per, you know, once per year survey um, and it was sent out at the institutional level. And we've shifted that uh, over the years. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Our research focuses on digital learning practices and trends in post-secondary education. And what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is really uh, those macro level, those big trends, and we're gonna be taking sort of a bird's eye view on what's happening across the province. So I want to acknowledge and thank our 2023 sponsors and partners, um, especially eCampus Ontario. Uh, eCampus Ontario has been with us from the beginning and they provide such strong, excellent support for our work. And we wouldn't be able to get the results and the data uh, that we do without eCampus Ontario and without the help of our other sponsors as well. That include BC Campus, Campus Manitoba, D2L, Contact North, uh, the Quebec Ministry of Education, and the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission. Uh, we also thank our partners, Bayview Analytics, Academica Group, and WCET. Um, our partners are instrumental in helping us share the survey and helping um, to get things running off the ground, and especially Bayview Analytics, who provides um, our analysis for our work that we do, and also is a strong um, partner with us in determining what we ask. And we also do a number of studies that we do in parallel with Bayview Analytics that uh, also run in the US that help us to get you know, the Canada and US perspective and do some of those comparisons. So about this year's survey, um, so we have this had the spring survey that ran from May 1st to June 30th. Um, it ran uh, within Canada, we had 438 individuals representing 125 different Canadian institutions. Now I want to pause here and talk about that for just a quick second, because as I mentioned, the survey has evolved over time. And so some of you have who have completed the survey in years past may have received you know one survey 
that was to be completed and passed around by multiple people at your institution. We're not doing that anymore. We are now moving to getting uh, individual perspectives and the perspectives of people in a variety of different roles. So uh, if you received a survey invitation this year, or you'd like to complete the survey this year, and I know Laura will be sharing the link in the chat uh, throughout my presentation, um, it is for your personal perspective. You don't, um, you know, you don't need to pass it around or share it with anyone. It's completely anonymous. And we are asking, we get multiple responses from people at institutions in different roles. And that allows us now to do an extra level of breakdown um, to see if there are different responses in different roles. You're not able to provide that level of breakdown for this survey uh, just because of the number of respondents, but our hope is to increase our number of respondents over time and to get um, to be able in the future to provide that role breakdown to see how different people are viewing things and their understand their vantage point at their institution. So in particular today I'm going to talk about the Ontario results. So these results represent 66 in we had sorry 66 individuals representing 35 different institutions uh, that responded and um, that was 64 respondents from 33 of the eCampus Ontario member institutions. The findings that I'm sharing today are going to reflect um, 55 responses from those who were in non-faculty roles. We didn't have enough faculty responses to be able to give that faculty uh, breakdown or that faculty perspective, but we would love to be getting more faculty responses. So if you're a faculty member, you are more than welcome and you are uh, invited to participate in the survey. And, that, and that's the fall one that we have running right now. So uh, digital transformation, uh, I love eCampus Ontario's definition of it. I'm just providing that to kind of ground us in our discussion today. So I love the way that eCampus Ontario defines it as, you know, the use of digital technologies to redefine how higher education delivers values to learners. And that I think is, you know, it's a broad definition, but it encompasses so much of what's happening right now in the higher education landscape across the country. And so I'm going to talk a bit about the indicators of digital transformation that we're seeing right now. So some of these are trends that are related to course delivery and technology adoption. And other indicators of digital transformation are the student and faculty attitudes that we're seeing towards technology integration. And I'm going to share some data that shows, um, and we, this is consistent with what we've seen over the years, especially since the start of the pandemic, um, with these, you know, trends toward um, technology use and technology integration and adoption of different technologies in teaching and learning. Before I get started, many of you have seen this before. This is the uh, revised modes of learning spectrum that was created um, in collaboration with uh, Baby U Analytics and WCET in the US uh, based on a study we did in 2022. Uh, it's also based on previous work uh, done by CDLRA where we asked institutions how they were defining these terms at their institution. So I'm just putting it up there so that you know when I am saying things like online learning, I'm meaning all classes or instructional activities that happen online where there's no on-campus requirement. And I understand that online learning is kind of an umbrella term. So it encompasses things like synchronous online, uh, com a combination of synchronous, asynchronous, asynchronous, uh, self-paced, um, emergency remote learning, where things are rapidly shifted online like we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. When I'm talking about hybrid learning, I'm talking about that mix of in-person and online, and it may be implemented in a variety of ways, you know, from flipped classrooms to high flex learning to, you know, mostly online instruction with an in-person intensive. The key thing with hybrid or learning is that it's there's some sort of mix. And I use that term synonymously with the term blended learning. I may also talk a bit about in-person learning. And when I'm talking about that, I'm mostly talking about technology supported in-person learning. It's very rare in this day and age 
to have an in-person component that doesn't have some degree of technology integration. You know, students, for the most part, even in an in-person course, are going to be using their laptops or devices for something. It's very rare, the two extreme ends of the spectrum, the in-person non-digital and the offline distance learning, um, they do still exist, but they really, really are a rarity in today's day and age. So with those definitions of modalities in line, uh, in mind, um, this is what we saw in the spring survey for the province of Ontario. And we asked our respondents, what was the likelihood of the following happening over the next 24 months? And uh, by and large, we see this trend towards hybrid learning that, you know, where a course or a program is partially online, there's that mix of online and in person. This is very consistent with what we are have been seeing um, since in person learning uh, resumed following the shift to fully online at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think what's really interesting here too is this isn't a comparison to you know pre-pandemic. This is a comparison to right now. So our respondents were asked to think about you know you know a couple months ago, spring 2023, and thinking of where they were at at that point, looking ahead 24 months, what were they envisioning? And so to see that there is an expectation that there's going to be even more hybrid learning than there is now, and there's going to be even more online learning, fully online learning than there is now. We're seeing also an expected increase in multi-access. So multi-access would be, um, for example, high flex learning where students are able to access the course in you know, multiple ways and decide day of how they're going to access that course. And then we still see that increase, you know, in more in-person courses, but not as much as the uh, hybrid and the online courses. In terms of technology trends, what's really interesting is, again, ask that same question, you know, compared to that right now in spring 2023, what do our respondents anticipate happening over the next 24 months? greater technology use regardless of mode. So even in those in-person courses, we are going to see greater technology use. And I think that is a very big key indicator of digital transformation. So digital learning and technology use and technology integration is not just, um, you know, in the silos of online and hybrid learning. This technology integration is happening everywhere in all classrooms, regardless of delivery mode. We're also seeing that trend in Ontario towards more alternative credential offerings, and also the support for use of open educational resources. And that's a question we're asking lots of OER related questions in the fall survey right now. And I've had a chance to see the preliminary data and some of it's really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to getting more voices talking about OER, because I think this is a big topic that's going to continue to kind of um, emerge. It's, OER has been around for a long, long time, but, uh, there seems to be, um, from what I'm seeing, an increased interest in it and exploration of it. And I think that that's very tied to the um, aspect of digital transformation that's related to greater technology use. Faculty preferences. Now, so this is um, the non-faculty's perception of uh faculty preferences. And by non-faculty, um, that group includes senior administrators, it includes deans and directors, it includes teaching and learning leaders. Um, so many of our respondents had uh, high touch points with faculty. And um, from the few faculty responses that we saw, and some, from some of the faculty responses we saw in other provinces, um, I would say that faculty scored themselves even higher than this, if we're looking at that. But uh, looking at these, uh, there's that overall sense that faculty are interested in adopting new technologies. Um, and at many institutions, it's all or most faculty, that perception that all or most faculty are interested in adopting new technologies. And there's definitely, in every case, some faculty 
who are interested, if not all or most. Um, many uh, respondents said that, you know, faculty would prefer the option of teaching online sometimes. They either had a group of some faculty at their institution, but about half of our respondents said that all or most faculty at their institution would prefer the option of teaching online sometimes. Um, so again, that tells us a lot about that digital transformation too. Prior to the pandemic, we know from the literature and the research that was done previously that one of a big barrier to the adoption of online learning was faculty resistance. We are seeing very different trends now um, in 2023 now that many faculty had exposure to teaching online during the pandemic, we've got, uh, you know, it, it's fairly common for faculty to say, yeah, I'd actually like to be able to teach online sometimes. And there is a group of faculty, if we look down, who would like to teach entirely on campus. And there are some who would also prefer to teach entirely online. So it seems that many of our respondents have this mix at their institution where they either have a large group of faculty who, you know, want to do um, some teaching in different mo modalities, um, and many, regardless of modality, who are interested in adopting new technologies. When we're looking at our respondents' uh, perspective, uh, perceptions of student preferences, and in many cases, uh, these are based um, on our respondents having access to student surveys, um, through their contact and conversations with students. This isn't just an opinion that they're kind of grabbing out of thin air. They are grounded in work that's, this opinion is grounded in work that's been done on their institution and uh, surveys of students. But overall, again, we're seeing a real sense of positivity towards technology use. Um, again, that hybrid learning comes up. So just like we saw with faculty as well, that having the option of learning online sometimes. Um, there are a core group of some institutions, you know, most of our respondents said that at least some of their students have a preference to learn entirely online. And, you know, similarly, so some of our, uh, you know, a lot, majority of our respondents said that at least some of their students prefer to learn entirely on campus. I think what's interesting when we're looking at those entirely online or entirely on campus findings that there's really only a small proportion of students who were, you know, a small proportion of respondents who said, you know, all or most students want to learn entirely on campus or all or most students, you know, prefer to learn entirely online. Um, and this kind of counters that narrative that, you know, all students are wanting to return on campus. They just want to, you know, take online learning and throw it away. Um, our data tells a completely different story and it has done so since, um, you know, 2020 and 2021, we've been seeing this pattern over and over and over again. So readiness for future change. I want to ask everyone here a question. Um, and we asked the same question in our spring survey. So I'll share their findings, but I'm going to put a poll up and I'm going to, oh, I don't have poll access. So I need someone else to put the poll up yeah, here. Um, I have put it. I just want to be sure if everybody can access that. I'm just going to launch it. Just let me know. Yeah. I can see it. Okay, great. This is really interesting seeing these findings come in. We're seeing, you know, about uh, just over half of people right now are saying, yep, about somewhat different, very different is coming up. We've got a few people saying slightly different. A um, little bit, a few people saying same as now. All right, so I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to just do that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I guess I've done. I did. I could do that on my end. I just couldn't. <laughs> <launch it. laughs> was, okay. Okay. So um, let me just do the stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the the results very different, somewhat different, slightly different yeah. there. And um, this is going to, this actually is really interesting because it's going to mirror what I'm going to show you in a second. So there we go. We can 
stop sharing that and um gonna move to the next slide here so we asked our respondents the same question thinking ahead to five years time what did they expect the future was going to be we had uh in ontario uh 100% of our respondents felt that it was going to be different to some extent, with 36% saying they imagined a very different future. Uh, and then again, this is not very different from pre-pandemic. This is very different from the right now. Um, we imagine about half of our respondents imagined that it would be somewhat different and a smaller proportion, 14% imagined slightly different. So very similar to what this group just posted in the poll. Uh, readiness for the future. Now, this is what was really interesting. And we saw uh, this similarly in Canada. Although a future that is, you know, considerably different, you know, very or somewhat different is imagined, for the most part, um, there's at least some level of preparedness that's feeling. So when we asked our respondents if they're ready for those changes in the future, you know, uh, just under a quarter said, yes, they're prepared for these changes, um, that there are, you know, some said that they were, you know, somewhat prepared, which would be the majority. And only a few, 8% said they weren't prepared at all. So again, I think that's is really good news from a tra digital transformation perspective. Um, big changes or at least small changes, um, changes expected, but for the most part, you know, everyone is feeling prepared to some extent and, you know, small, more people are feeling that yes, they are prepared than uh, people who are feeling no, they're not prepared. We also asked as well, optimism and pessimism about the future. And this is really cool. Um, I think that it's so neat that we see uh, this really high level of optimism about the future of higher education. So, you know, just over three quarters of our respondents said that they feel optimistic about the future of higher education. And those who didn't feel optimistic, uh, felt more neutral. Um, and uh, very few said that they felt pessimistic. Now, really interestingly, uh, we've did, th these questions were asked in a parallel study in the US as well. And um, the folks at Bayview Analytics and myself were putting together a paper right now that compares the Canada data to the US uh, data on these questions. And we certainly see that on the US side of things, uh, there's a far greater degree of uh, pessimism than we're seeing in the Canadian side of things. So, you know, right now I'm doing an, an analysis of those reasons and looking into it, but um, Canadians for the most part, and certainly in Ontario are feeling optimistic about the future of higher education. So really quickly, just overcoming uh, digital transformation challenges. Um, these are key issues that have come up um, that need to be addressed to you know, bring about that change that we're seeing. Um, over and over, we're seeing um, just whether through comments or data um, and even in past years, questions about faculty competencies. And there's this is a complex topic because it's not for a lack of want on uh, the side of faculty. Um, faculty, we also know that some of our challenges, and I'll bring this up in a second, uh, faculty fatigue and burnout consider, continues to be a major challenge for faculty across the country. Um, and then there's also, you know, constraints related to collective agreements uh, when it comes to professional development for faculty to develop these uh, skills that are needed to teach with technology and to you know, go beyond just the how to's that technical knowledge on, you know, how, how to, you know, run, a, you know, a live classroom, like a live asynchronous session, or how to post things in a learning management, you know, system to the engagement side of things. And that pedagogical aspect of how do I, you know, connect with learners and engage learners when I'm, in an online space with them. Um, there's also some teaching and learning challenges and operational challenges that I will bring up here too. Um, 
So when we talk about faculty competencies, just first of all, we asked our respondents, again, these non-faculty respondents, um, you know, do your faculty have the skills and know how to effectively teach? You know, fully in person, there seemed to be this consensus that yes, our, you know, faculty have the skills and know how to teach fully in person. When we, um, with minimal technology, when we got into fully in person and added substantial technology, that number of all or most faculty dropped quite consistently or quite considerably. Um, and we're seeing just sort of that split that 44%, um, you know, all or most or some faculty saying, you know, that they could do that. So the more technology seems to be uh, required or the heavier the technology use for the course, um, the less confident uh, the non-faculty uh, institutions are feeling in faculty competencies to effectively teach in those environments. Um, and multi-access, of course, is where we saw the lowest. And that is in many ways related to the logistics of teaching in a multi-access environment. So in that sort of context, uh, your faculty member would not only be teaching to the students who were you know, physically present in the room, but also be teaching to students who were attending via live stream and also continuing to make sure that it would be a quality teaching and learning experience for those students who weren't attending in person or via live stream, but who were intending to come and watch it, uh, you know, asynchronously following the, the class session. When we go into teaching and learning challenges, um, we actually saw faculty fatigue and burnout being higher in other parts of the country. When we come to Ontario, we see uh, one of our bigger teaching and learning challenges being academic integrity. Um, and that makes complete sense with the way the year has gone. Um, we, we don't have any, you know, historical data on AI from past years um, other than you know, with it kind of being woven into some of, you know, other things that institutions were doing in, you know, pre-pandemic. But it came, as we all know, came to the forefront at the end of 2022 with the launch of ChatGPT. And it has certainly made waves in higher education with institutions grappling uh, with how they are going to, um, what kind of policies they're going to put in place for AI, how they're going to allow students to use it or instruct students to use it. And it's a bit of, uh, it, it's very um, emergent with lots of different policies happening depending on the institution there. Um, but that's where we see academic integrity coming up at the top. And then we also see faculty digital literacy coming up there and then accommodating uh, diverse learning needs. But by and large, academic integrity right now is one of the biggest challenges. Um, operational challenges also are an important thing to consider and that need to be addressed to support uh, digital transformation. And one of the key ones that we're seeing in Ontario is technology infrastructure and impact on faculty workload. And again, these are the most pressing challenges. So that's why we're seeing it at 19%, 16%, like faculty or sorry, our respondents were asked to pick all that apply. And then out of the ones they picked, we're asked to pick their most pressing. And um, so that's why you're seeing the lower numbers here, because this is what our respondents selected as their, what they thought were the most pressing operational challenges at their institution. And again, in this technology infrastructure and impact on faculty workload were, were very big, which is also important when we're talking about faculty competencies, like I said before, and the professional development, um, there's a sense of being conscious about um, not overloading faculty as well, because we know that they're feeling still feeling incredibly burnt out from the past few years. So... I'm going to launch into our Q&A. Um, I just, again, want to thank everyone for coming here today, thanking our sponsors, our partners, our respondents in the fall survey, or sorry, in the spring survey, and also thanking the people who've responded so far to the fall survey. Um, I've got my email address here, and I've got um, a place where you can 
check out all of our past publications as well. Um, additionally, uh, if you are interested in participating in future studies, so if you want to receive uh, invitations for when we have surveys coming out, including our current fall survey, um, if you scan this QR code, it will take you to um, a sign-up sheet where you can sign up to be added to our roster, so that you can be um, so that you can be notified when we've got a survey or a study coming out. So I think with that all said, I am ready to field some questions from the group. Wow, Th thank you, Nicole. I mean, that was so engaging. I was just so engrossed in, uh, you know, the findings. Uh, so uh, so now the floor is open for any q and I think as we just did in the start, we will stop recording now uh, so that you can feel free to ask your questions. Uh, 